So Glenn, Glenn Bozinski is my name. I'll be here nearly 35 years. I've been here nearly 35 years. I'll be here 35 years this coming September. So more than a third of the lifespan of this college has had Glenn Bozinski walking these halls. Um, how I got here, when I, uh, after I graduated college, I worked for a brief period of time, about a year and a half, as a reporter, a uh, newspaper reporter. Uh, and was sort of looking for something different. And actually, my, my wife, Laura, girlfriend then, wife now, saw the ad in the paper for an admissions counselor and came out and explored it. Uh, was certain after I left the initial interview that I was not going to take the job if offered it. Um, yet got a second interview and ultimately decided this might be the place for me to be for a little while. Uh, I figured maybe six months. Uh, and here we are almost 35 years later. Happily, I have not left. The, uh, I was first first started in 1989 as an, as an admissions counselor, um, recruiting students all over New York State and the New England states. Um, after some time, I added parts of New Jersey to my recruitment area. Um, this was under Dr. De Pasquale, um, who I was first hired under, and, and then later Dr. Job, who was president. Um, before too long, um, there were some changes to the department, and I became the, the person primarily responsible for recruiting transfer students. Um, a lot of time spending relationships, uh, building relationships with LCC, uh, other community colleges, schools, and really sort of advancing that area uh, of bringing in transfer students, which we didn't have as many of uh, when we started, uh, we started that role. Um, before too long, my role expanded to become assistant director, still having responsibility to, uh, to work with those transfer students, but also working more again with the first year students who are coming in. So in 2000, roughly 2006, I was named director of admissions, um, which is still, I believe, the longest role I've held at the university. Uh, for over a decade, I was director of admissions um, before becoming the institution's first vice president of enrollment management in 2017. Um, so a long arc, all within the Department of Admissions and Enrollment Management, seen a lot of growth, a lot of change, both in the university's composition, um, the diversity of our student body, the size of our student body over those uh, over those 35 years. Uh, one of the things that I think that, that really, um, that I think about often in my role is because we're the enrollment folks, because we're the admissions folks, we get to know students before almost anybody else on this campus does. We know them a year, year and a half, two years before they actually enroll. The only other, the only other folks on campus that have a similar situation would be the coaches who recruit students and get to know them as high school juniors or seniors, or for an adult learner or a transfer, get to know them a year before they start here. Really meaningful to me that on, on um, commencement day, when those students walk across the stage, I and the team of folks that work with me recruiting students have known them longer than anybody. We've been with them for a longer part of their journey and their parents and their significant others, etc., for a long period of time. It, it really is meaningful to see students walk across the stage knowing that you were with them on their first steps toward misericordia and kind of see their growth and their progression. Then ultimately you meet them out in the world as alumni. You run into them um, in all sorts of places and you really kind of catch up on their lives and you see that you've been engaged with them for decades in some cases. It's really, really one of the most meaningful parts of the work to see students progress like that through their education and beyond. You know, when I think back on those early years and I started here back in 1989 as, as a young professional, I think of, of, of the folks that I worked with um, who were veteran leaders at the institution at that point, David Payne. Um, who is the uh, uh, the dean of admissions? Sort of sits in the chair that I sit in now. All those years ago, who was who was such an incredible mentor and a role model, and Tom O'Neill, the uh, the dean of adult education, um, the many sisters of mercy that uh, that worked here at that time. There were a lot more sisters that were actively involved in the in the day to day life. Sister Annette Diebold, uh, who um, managed our admissions office for many years, and many of the other sisters. Sister Mary Glennon, um, who I speak about often as our academic dean. These were the folks that, that as a young professional really helped um, me understand how to grow into the role I, I take on today, but also the incredible impact this institution has on its students and on the community around it. Um, and one thing I think about a lot in my role today is the great responsibility I have and my staff has 
to carry that on, um, to continue to be servants and, and of, of the legacy of this institution, uh, to continue to serve students uh, in, in a way that they go out there and, and, and spread misericordia um, and the good works that they learned here all over the world. Um, that's really the thing. When you think of the extension that you have as a person who interacts with hundreds of students directly or indirectly, and those students come out as professionals and work in different fields from education to healthcare to business, and you meet and run into some of those students, you think back to those early days when you were 23, 24 years old, and the folks who influenced you and impacted you uh, to, to grow in your profession and, and how that now sort of happens, happens to those students. One of the things that was kind of a full circle moment for me um, is I had worked here 20 plus years at this point, and I had a, an aunt who I was very close to, an elderly aunt who was still in terrific health into her 90s and um, had a health condition by which she needed to become, at age 92, a double amputee. Um, incredibly difficult situation and she soldiered through it, really, really handled that situation well and went into rehabilitation care um, where she quickly progressed despite what anybody believed might happen to a 92 year old who was in that situation. And one of the first people I met and ran into was a student that I had in freshman year experience that was now head of occupational therapy at a healthcare facility. And as my aunt progressed to, a, to an assisted living community where she could do almost all the functions she did before from a wheelchair, totally cared for herself for a number of years as she lived out her life, it was Misericordia Physical Therapists and Misericordia Occupational Therapists that worked with her and helped her progress in ways that we as a family never thought she'd possibly do that. So I look back at this work I've done all these years and see that these, these young people that we helped recruit and that this institution helped prepare actually had a real impact on my life. It was really sort of incredible to realize that, to see that happen, to see these, these young students be people that really extended my aunt's life, not only in, in, in her years, but in the incredible quality she had, um, despite this, uh, this health, serious health situation. One of my favorite traditions at Misericordia, and it's one that, that I play a, a really central role in, is our um, convocation ceremony. It's where the university community, many of us in cap and gown, welcome the new first year class. 400 plus students, hopefully this year more than that, um, coming to campus, sitting in our beautiful amphitheater, hearing the message from one of, our, one of our alum and sort of being formally welcomed to the institution, typically right before the point where they say goodbye to mom and dad and truly um, become residents of our Misericordia community. It's the best day of the year on campus, I think, even better than even better than commencement. That welcoming sense and that idea that the whole college community says, hey, you young people, you're now part of us. We're all here to, to achieve great things together is one of my favorite things on campus. It's a great tradition. I don't know that it's done in quite the same way on any, on any other college, college campus uh, that I've heard about, but I think it's really, really meaningful. When I first started here, the full-time enrollment was 880 students. We're now well over 2,000 students. And, um, more than half of the buildings on this campus were not here when I, when I started here. Um, either buildings we, we now own that we didn't, or in most cases, new construction. It is physically so different. Um, there was no true center of campus the way there is now with the way the library, which wasn't here, in Salaka Hall, the science facility, frames that center of campus and makes it feel like a quad, I think, is, is a big piece of visually what the campus looks like. The Anderson Center was not here yet. Um, we were not NCAA Division Three Athletics, and since that time, we've had national champions. We've had um, students that have gone on to be the top professionals in their field in, in just about every field. Um, from Al Sanaseri, a young man who was in my freshman year experience, who's now an executive with the New York Yankees. Uh, you think of um, um, uh, the founders of Operation Smile, a Misericordia alumni, and various other things. So you see all these incredible impacts we've had in the world, but the institution has changed so dramatically. Uh, like I said, one of the things that you miss is the day-to-day 
number of Sisters of Mercy who are on campus teaching and working in administrative roles. That is, is certainly diminished, but I think over that time, while the sisters are less physically present, I think our identification with the charisms and the widely known nature of those charisms have gotten stronger. I think, hear, and know more about the charisms now than I did in 1989, 1990. And that's just not a personal thing. I think they're more present. I think the sisters' critical concerns, their focus on areas like nonviolence and immigration and the environment, really, even as an order that, that is, has uh, sponsored this place for over 100 years, their message resonates more now than it did when I got here. I think that's an incredible thing for me. Um, when you look at the worldview of a misreported student, I think it's, despite us being a hundred year old institution, that we are helping mold students who are very in tune um, with the modern world. And I think that's really exciting to me. I think that's one of the changes that probably flies under the radar, that we've evolved in a way that matches the evolution of society in a very positive way. I think one of the things that, that all, all people who come here and stick around for a period of time, be it long or short, be they students, be they faculty, be they staff, I think they pretty quickly understand and to various degrees get imbued with the values of the institution. And by those values, I talk about the, the charism, certainly, that we all talk about, the critical concerns of the sisters, uh, the way as we look at the world that we can have a positive impact. I think those values in whatever career path someone takes, in whatever life path someone takes, they can adapt those values and those charisms to their own life in a way that, that sort of positively impacts the world around them. And I think Misericordia draws special people and it sends special people out into the world. Uh, I, I once talked to a parent who was speaking, uh, she was a parent who had a clinical role and had over the years had a number of Misericordia health healthcare clinicians under her training and tutelage, as she did from a number of other schools. And she rattled off a list of schools and said, they're all great schools, but the students who come out of Misericordia to become clinicians have something special, have a special empathy and a care that I don't see from any other the students of any other institution that I have, there's something special about this place. And that was a, that was a, a mother who was visiting with her, um, with her child, talking about a misericordia she was barely aware of, but she got the idea of what our students were like, just interacting, interacting with them in a clinical setting. Um, another story I, I tell often is, you know, families often tell us they visit eight, 10, 12 campuses, but they find something special about us. And, and one summed it up really well. She said, I've gone to other campuses with my son or my daughter, and I asked where the admissions office is, and a nice, friendly student points me to that office. At Misericordia, when they did that, the student walked me to the admissions office. That's the difference in Misericordia.